grandmother taught me the adage, it takes a village. The work that I do is very village oriented, is very people centered and deeply rooted in passion and purpose. You're listening to Side Hustle Pro, the podcast that teaches you to build and grow your side hustle from passion project to profitable business. And I'm your host, Nikayla Matthews Okome. So let's get started. Hey, hey guys, welcome, welcome back to the show. So I am so excited this week because last week I announced that Side Hustle Pro Live is going down October 9th in Washington, D.C. And you guys, the response has been amazing. Thank you for those of you who've already bought your ticket. So in the first 24 hours, like 30% of tickets were sold. So that just blew me away. And you know what that means. That means this event is going to sell out. So if you're thinking of coming, I highly suggest you grab your ticket now. Head over to SideHustlePro.co slash live. You'll be able to see Side Hustle Pro come to life. We'll have a live onstage conversation with special guest Maya Elias. There'll be Q&A, a pre-show shopping experience with Side Hustle Pro guest vending. And you'll have time for Q&A with me. Plus, if you get a VIP meet and greet ticket, we'll get to spend some time together before the show. And we have some other surprises in store. I am really excited. I have been overwhelmed and blessed by the response. As you guys know, this is something I've wanted to do for a while, but I really just wanted to understand how to do it first. And I'm glad I did it because it has been a lot, you know, a lot goes into putting on an event and I'm learning so much and it's making me really, really appreciative and grateful for the response and the support. Um, I've had former uh, Side Hustle Pro guests who are in the DC area say they're going to come in bulk. Um, you know, my, my taught you retreat sisters come in as a group. Like it's, it's really, really dope. So thank you guys. And if you know of a friend, if you know of anyone who will be in the DMV or can travel to the DMV, make sure you tell them to come out sidehustlepro.co slash live. It is going to be a really phenomenal night. We are going to cover a lot and I'm really excited to be able to bring the show to life in this way. So if you haven't grabbed your tickets yet, just head over to sidehustlepro.co slash live. So today in the guest chair, we have Dr. Lakeisha Hallman, the founder and CEO of The Village Market. Since 2016, Dr. Hallman has been a transformational leader and speaker by bringing national exposure to Black-owned businesses. She's developed an economical vehicle that empowers the Black community through cooperative economics. And educated by passion, she began hosting masterclasses to provide tangible tools, resources, and connections to encourage forward progression as a community. The desire that launched the Village Market ATL only three months later was twofold, to support socially conscious, community-minded entrepreneurs and startups of color. Dr. Key's personal quote is, each of us must dedicate ourselves to serving the good of our people. We are a community. Our fate and futures are interconnected. If we act in oneness and in the spirit of togetherness, not only can we survive, we can thrive. I was blessed to cross paths with Dr. Key at Summit 21 in Atlanta this past June. Shout out to past Side Hustle Pro guest Jewel Burke Solomon for introducing us. And Dr. Key's energy and commitment to the mission of national exposure, as well as tools and resources for Black-owned businesses is so inspiring. I just had to have her in the guest chair. So let's jump right into this valuable conversation. Welcome to the guest chair, Dr. Key. Thank you so much. Super excited to be here today. Super excited to have you. Now, you are from Batesville, Mississippi, and I personally have never been to Batesville. So I just want to take a second to understand what was it like growing up in Mississippi and how did that upbringing influence who you are today? In the big city of Batesville, Mississippi, uh, (laughs) (laughs) for all of those who have not traveled there, um, Batesville, Mississippi sits in North Mississippi, um, small town very communal, very village oriented. Uh, Everything of who I am, about who I am, was informed by the people who live there. That's my my family, my teachers, my church family, my friends. And my whole state of being comes from all these people who've who've poured into me. 
Now, there's not a lot happening in Batesville, I tell you that. So as a young child, I often found myself getting lost in the in the clouds because I could see all these things that I wanted to to be and do. And Batesville doesn't afford you the physical ability to see that. Um, so my parents, what they did, um, blue collar workers, they allowed my sister and I at the time to just really be creative and tell us how big the world was, even if we if they couldn't take us those places. My dad always said that there's things so much bigger than Baseville. So I don't want you to get stuck here. I just want you to start here. And that echoes in my mind all the time when when I'm traveling and being able to see the world. But every every part of who I am links back uh, to growing up on a gravel road, running across the field from my grandma's house to my great grand- grandparents' house and picking muscadines and getting in lots of trouble. <laughs> so now, how would you say it influenced your career path? With um, with the work that I do is very village oriented, is very people centered um, and deeply rooted in passion and purpose. My grandmother taught me the adage, it takes a village. I saw that in physical form being manifested every day in Baseville. As I said, I was running from field to field. I was running across, uh, running through my grandfather's crops, actually, and probably ruining some watermelons and some greens. (laughs) (laughs) But... A lot of the community shop from my my grandparents and a lot of the women in, in the choirs uh, from different churches and a lot of the schools. My grandmother was the seamstress. So in the spirit of entrepreneurship, I got to sit at the feet of it by seeing it from my grandmother and my grandfather. And as I grew into this person that is constantly evolving I always think about how did my grandmother and grandfather make people feel? And that's the customer service piece. And what was the greater work that they were doing? And they were building a safe community. With the village market, I try to typify the the same vibration. I want people to feel good. I want people to feel happy, but I also want people to make money so they can sustain. Absolutely. Now, You are Dr. Key. So I'm interested in your career path before opening up the village market. What was your initial career goal? My initial career goal, and I'm actually still in that career as well, uh, was to be an educator, was to be in the education field. I remember, um, I can't remember what it was called back in the day, but I was in third grade and you had, oh, career day. And you have to come to school and be and be who you wanted to be. I came to school as a teacher. I was very clear that I wanted to teach. And as I graduated from high school, went to Tougaloo College, I knew. I knew what my next would be. And my career started in the Mississippi Delta, Equipment County High School, as a high school English teacher. I was able to grow into administration and then move into the Georgia Department of Education, which has which still is a part of my my makeup. So education is still who I am now. And so you pursued your doctorate at some point to, was it to be a professor? I pursued my doctorate um, because I wanted to be a stronger researcher. I have a strong interest in policy um, to, to make better informed decisions on how I teach and how to teach parents and also teachers how to be advocates of education. And from my professors at Tougaloo, I learned the best way to do that is to go and get a higher education, but to be grounded in research. So in my my goals of becoming Dr. Key or Dr. Hallman at that time was twofold. I knew that my, my family is void of the doctor name. And also, I wanted to be the best in my field and the most informed in my field and to be in a, in, in a, in a community of people who are thinking and moving in that way. So that's the reason why I did this crazy thing and wrote a dissertation and went to graduate school to get my doctorate. This is so interesting, connecting the dots, looking backwards and seeing how you followed this path of being an educator and 
when you initially get on that path, it looks like it's going to be one thing, but you realize so many people need education, right? It's not just within the confines of a classroom per se. What you're doing now, you are fulfilling that purpose. When did you tie that together? When did you tie that you are interested in entrepreneurship and helping entrepreneurs plus you're combining that with your education background? It was possibly... Um, between seven and eight years ago, I was still in school, of course, I was still teaching. And the true entrepreneur spirit that something can still, you can enjoy something, but still want something else. And what I wanted was freedom. I knew that I was a good teacher, but that didn't mean I wanted to do lesson plans. (laughs) Okay. And what kind of things did you teach? Did you teach a particular grade? Yes, I taught 11 and 12th grade English. And I just remember teaching one and every day I wanted to take my, my, my students outside to, to learn. I wanted to take them in the in, in experience and teach my classes there. And sometimes the, uh, due to the confines of education, you can't always do that. And I'm a firm believer that I can have what I want if I work hard enough for it. So the entrepreneur spirit just kept just coming into me every single day. And I didn't know at that time that it would be the village market, but what I asked God for was just to give me a space with a, where I can make, where I can teach anywhere that almost um, symbolically that the world can become my classroom. And I was within five months of writing that prayer out at work, by the way, I was able to move from the classroom and go to the dark, go to the department of education Moving from the school actually helped me see that I could do something else. But the entrepreneur spirit was still, oh, this is still not good enough. This is good, but this is not what my ultimate goal is. And I just started teaching classes at Urban Grind Coffee Shop here, a woman-owned coffee shop in Atlanta. I I told Cassandra, the owner, I said, I want to teach classes on community. I want to teach classes on entrepreneurship. And I want to teach classes where people can uh, feel safe and also learn how to be well in whatever their calling is. And she said yes. And without knowing many people in Atlanta, I just hopped on my bike and being my Mississippi self, speaking to everybody and telling (laughs) (laughs) that I was going to do this new series. It's called It Takes a Village in Atlanta. And people came. Actually, my first class, about 109 people came. Wow. Yeah. And that was my first time being able to teach the way I felt in my spirit outside of the classroom. And within six months, um, teaching and building community, I realized the next step would be now I have business owners in the space or people like me who are really hungry for community and people who've made and created things, now I need to create a way that Atlanta knows that they exist. And that's when I created the village market. Mm. So to take a step back for a second, what do you mean by teaching community? What what did that entail as far as the instructions that you were giving to people? Um, very principle-guided um, classes. The principles are there's enough for all of us because th- these things are not new that everything that we need is in our community and that it's okay to work together, that competition can fuel us, but it shouldn't divide us. Um, And that we can't remember from whence we came. That's, those are my founding principles of it takes a village. And so when people will come in to learn about entrepreneurship or small business development, we will go over the guiding principles first because I didn't want people to go and learn these things and create these businesses and then create in silo. That's not true community. And I didn't want people to learn and forget what comes next. And that is to teach. So if you came to my classes, you had to commit to teaching what you learn without a charge because I was teaching what I learned without a charge. And to me, that is the ultimate charge of community. So now talk us through how the village market came to be. Now that you saw that there was this need, there was this interest in understanding these principles of community. When did it come to you to open up this space and what were the first steps that you took? The village market came, again, riding my bike. It actually came when I was working on my doctorate. And I saw the village 
and I saw the people and I saw the the vendors, but I'd never done anything like that before. So I kind of blinked it away because I was like, oh, that couldn't be for me. And then it came back again. And so what I asked for was just time to finish school. When I finished school in September, I gave myself the three months to kind of write out what I see in my mind. And I started the classes at Urban Grind first because I needed to know if I built this thing, what am I building it for? I needed a relationship to it. Um, And within three to four months, I created the Village Market. And I know it sounds as if I'm missing steps, (laughs) but that is truly it's truly how it happened. I never booked the venue before. I'd never been a vendor. Um, I never sold tickets to anything. <laughs> I just could see this in in my mind. And so I asked one of my closest friends who is brutally honest. Uh, I called her and I said, well, Danielle, I need help with something that I see that I don't really necessarily know how to do. But I want you to make sure I do this. And you will also be honest with me if I'm somehow getting lost in what what I tell you, the vision I see in my mind. And we started the Village Market with a splash that page and a couple friends and people I met at the coffee, business owners who I met at the coffee shop with 30 vendors at that time. And 500 people, 562 people came out. And we didn't have an Instagram page or any of that. Just a lot of purpose in what I was trying to create. But I can't share again. I never had any experience being this person who was over a village market. I just wasn't scared to do it, though. Yes. Yes. That that is the key. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't even know what it was going to be, to be really honest. And so when I had to talk about it initially, I would tell people that. I want people to come and feel loved. I want businesses to see that their work and efforts are not in vain. And I want businesses to make money because as much as people can praise black owned businesses for a black owned business owner, nothing feels greater than the praise of currency that somebody actually bought something that you made with your mind. And I was very clear that that's to me, that's the greatest outcome that I wanted. I didn't want people just to gather. I wanted people to circulate the dollar. And so as I talked about it, when I was figuring it out myself, I was clear on my goals. But that's my education background of having clear and measurable goals of what I want my outcomes to be. And of course, my goals have changed and or or they continue to grow. But I based it on we will have this to get to here. I love so many things about what you just said and so many things I want to call out. As you were speaking, I do really keep thinking about that education background and that trend I see in teachers, like because you're accustomed to writing these lessons, lesson plans, you are clear in the outcomes you want. You're clear in how to help people see the vision and educate them along the way. Also, of course, the greatest praise is currency, really emphasizing that this is an opportunity to circulate that dollar and to do it in a way where we're benefiting our community. Now, let's take a step back here as well, because not everyone has been to the village market, including myself, right? Um, what is the village market in essence? How do it, does it work logistically? So is this something you do once a month? Is this something you do weekly? And then how do you choose businesses? How does it work? So first, can I start with saying that the Village Market is the dopest thing I have ever done. Uh, we have the we have the Village Market quarterly, which is a large gathering of about 80 to 100 black owned businesses. 60 percent of those businesses being local to Atlanta slash Georgia and then the 40% being across the United States or international. How it works is somewhat like any other um, marketplace or expo in a sense that we have a vetting process. Um, Businesses apply and very humbly at this point, every marketplace, we're going through my team and I about 600 applications that we have to vet and, and, and screen to see if they would be a good fit for this market. 
when we're looking for businesses, we're looking for businesses that are contributing to the overall well-being of community and that have great potential to uh, contribute to the overall economy. So the businesses have to be holistic. If if, a, if it's a merchandise company, then whatever the message is has to be that of empowering language because that's our debt that we must pay to me, uh, to community. Um, before we ever get to this quarterly marketplace, when we choose businesses, we go through extensive training with, with the businesses whom we select. We go through a webinar process and then we have a physical class that I call empowerment classes where the businesses gather together, where they can start building community within themselves so they can learn, well, I, you know, I buy my t-shirts from here. I use this kind of company. So then we can start thinking about the collective power of collaboration. If you can't afford 5,000 t-shirts on your own, you both can put in together to get 10,000 t-shirts or five of y'all can. And I wanted to create that experience to allow the teaching of that to almost come by human nature. And it did. Um, but I also wanted them to be prepared to operate in excellence when the doors open. So that was my true purpose for having the class, that if I know that when the doors open, thousands of people are coming with one purpose, and that is to this, uh, financially support Black-owned businesses. It will behoove us not to be prepared and to have our businesses operating at the highest level of excellence and customer service being one. So we train. Then we get to the place where it's time to experience the village market, which features a plant based cafe inside. We select about 15 to 20 culinary artists and then about 70 businesses that range across a plethora of talents and services from now 17 states in about seven countries. And we just solidified a partnership with the Bahamas at our, at our last marketplace. I hope I answered your question. Oh, yes, I'm listening. I'm taking it all in because this is unlike anything I've ever heard of. The fact that you have classes is just incredible. It's like, I'm not just going to have you come into this marketplace and make money, but not understand how to make a lasting business. Yeah, I I didn't with everything that I do. Um, and this is I don't credit this to anything about who I am, but this is how I was raised, that we have to be very principled in how we treat people and that our morals should always kind of bleed out of us. It would. How can I say that I'm for community, that if the only thing you need to give me is your vendor payment? then I give you an event. I can't say that I'm for the sustainability of our community, that if we're, that all these great people who I know in Atlanta who are successful business owners, if I don't bring them in to teach how to get to their point and then exceed it. So, and how do you get them on board with that in terms of there's a certain commitment involved with showing up? You might sign up, you might say, yes, I'm going to do this. But is it like you're literally taking attendance? And if you haven't completed X, Y, Z, you cannot be in the village. I get them on board because I don't waver on my standard. And so everyone doesn't like that, of course. Um, some businesses feel that, of course, the village market is way too anal. But. I believe in being anal and having a high standard of who we work with. That's the reason why this event that is unsponsored can, can attract businesses to come invest from out of state and in other countries to come. I, I believe standards, people will rise and meet them. And they are sometimes intimidated by it, but also inspired by having a level of excellence. But I don't I don't waver. I know what I know if they trust the process, I know what they will get out of it will supersede any vendor fee that they've ever paid. Now, as you are building this out, I'm curious, how were you sustaining yourself as um, as an entrepreneur? So was this your side hustle as you were still teaching? I was an, it, it was a, it was a, a side hustle. Um, but to answer the question, I didn't always sustain myself well. Uh, I was running on negative fumes on most days. 
because working a full-time job with the Georgia Department of Education, being required to travel and train teachers at this point all over and spend really burning the midnight oil and then the two, three o'clock in the morning oil to build the village, I almost depleted myself because I had to learn how to ask for help. I had to learn to take days off. And I had to learn all the things that I listened to in all my great audio books and all the books that I read that self-care must come first. I worked so hard that I almost fired my own self from the village um, because physically it was hard for me to keep up the pace of what was in my heart because I wasn't taking care of myself well. And when I realized that I wasn't, I felt that I was being a contradiction to everything that I, when I'm asked to speak in places, I'm always talking about taking care of yourself. Um, If you take care of yourself, then your calling will respond. I always say these things, but I wasn't doing it. And when I see myself in a way that I don't approve of, I call my own self to the carpet. So I had to go back in, in my little cocoon or my woman cave um, that I've created here at my home to really do a deep assessment of if this is taking everything from me, this can't be what God meant for me to do. So I had to figure out the balance of it. Um, And I did, I had to take some things away. I got help at that time. It was a two woman team, but now it's like nine of the most magical unicorns in Atlanta on my team. But I wouldn't have attracted these. I would not have attracted these women to help me and all um, my friends who are business owners in Atlanta to now become mentors on my board. I wouldn't have attracted those people if I didn't realize that I had an issue with asking for help. The most magical unicorns. I mean, you need to tell us how you attracted. I mean, (laughs) I know you were taking (laughs) care of yourself at this point, but listen, good help is just, I'm just, in awe of everyone who's able to build out a really solid team um, because I think that's one of the hardest things you have to do as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm always surprised. I'm always very thankful for them. I tell them this all all the time that y'all saved my life. Y'all saved the village. But I don't, I can't, I wish I could give you the blueprint of how I attracted these people. I feel like one day one person came and said, Dr. Key, I'm very, um, you know, really good in, in design and programming. How can I help you with the village? And this is someone who I worked out with for three years and had no idea. And her name is Kristen. And she said, no, I'll, I'll help you. And at that time, honestly, I was like, Kristen, how do you have time to help me? She said, if I didn't have time to help, I wouldn't tell you I would. And I just hushed. And Kristen came on board and then another young lady, Courtney, came on board and people just continued to just come on board who would come to the village market and get inspired. Or if they didn't come to the village market, they came to an event that I was speaking at and get inspired. But it was nothing. I I wish it was a blueprint If this is how you build a team. I think the best way to build a team is to operate in honesty but to also have something attractive where people want to work with you. I think people can feel the love for what you do from the words and how you speak of it. Yes. And when it's the right people, it, their spirit is just moved to kind of fill in, fill in the gaps for you. And that has continuously worked for me. When you did the initial one, what happened after that? Did you immediately have, not immediately, but did you have the business vision fleshed out as far as the amount, the the frequency and the revenue model that you wanted to come from this village market? Absolutely not. So how did you develop it? (laughs) So after the first village market, I remember going home, I was like, God, people came. And I was just walking around my apartment, just smiling at the time. Like, I cannot believe people came to this thing. And I was flooded the next morning with emails that when was the next one. I didn't even plan the next one. My mind can only see the first one. When I realized that people wanted the next one and that the small businesses had a good, a good time, my next steps, I worked for about a month to develop the business model and my business plan because that's what all my smart friends did. They created a business plan uh, first. 
And I was like, oh, I believe it's time for me to do this. And that's when I looked at what I had. I look at my first village market as almost pilot research, a pilot study. And I knew what, how many more people that I wanted to come. I knew how, based on the vendor fee, how to assess what's a good night to a small business. Um, and I just developed, I developed it from there, but that's more of a um, reverse analysis almost of being able to have the event and then build a business around it. And when did you know that this was something that you could center your life around? Like you could stop having it be a side hustle and be your full main business. I'm still learning that, uh, still, but I believe it was two years ago. The village market is three years old. We had, whenever Wakanda was out, that may have been last year. Uh, 26, I thought, was that 20, I can't, I should, 2016, I think. <laughs> yeah, if not 2017. 2017, okay. Yeah. Uh, whenever Wakanda came out, we had a village market in yes. February. And the February event is probably the, the most defining moment for my faith. We had continued to grow, but I I didn't see it being what it was. We we opened the doors at five o'clock and the manager of the venue came to get me and she said, uh, Dr. Key, we have a problem. I thought somebody passed out in the parking lot or something. So I'm trying to find my nurse on staff and she's like, No, um, the fire marshal called and you the event has shut down eighty five north. And I said, what, what do you mean? She said, car, car, so many cars are trying to get here that the interstate now is shut down and cars are in gridlock. And nothing prepared me for that moment that I could create, that with the help of my team, um, that we could create this event that so many people would come who wanted to be there at five o'clock that now we saw traffic in one of the busiest cities in America. And if we put that akin to concerts, if Beyonce comes in town, of course we expect that to happen. Um, if Atlanta United is playing, of course you expect to be in traffic. But I don't know many times when I've seen people have the same type of response to supporting Black-owned businesses. That night affirmed my faith that this was something different and that if I was hesitating in my walk, that it was okay to speed up, that we were safe and secure. Of course, we had to fix the issue, but that did it for me. Um, because again, Wakanda was happening at that time, but the village market had already, we set that date in, in December. It blew my mind. It still, blew, it still blows my mind. And it's very humbling that, that's the type of response that we have with, with the village. That is amazing. And I, I just looked it up. Uh, Wakanda was 2018. I can't believe it. I, I'm really, it wow. seems so long ago. <laughs> I'm like, was it 2014? Wow. No, it was 2018. <laughs> um, so one thing I want to speak about a little bit more is the revenue piece, because, you know, in addition to community and supporting each other, we also have to not be afraid to talk about money and to talk about revenue. So something I'm trying to wrap my mind around is um, if you have these quarterly markets, how do you sustain the business? You know, what is the revenue model exactly? Good question. Uh, and I do agree with you. that The only way we can really teach this thing is that people need to understand how it works. Um, so the, the revenue generating model with the village market is that when we have those three large quarterly events, of course, there's a vendor fee, there's a ticket fee at the door. Um, but we also have one off events throughout the year where if there's no village market going on, we still have things going on monthly. They're just not as big as the village market. We also have our online boutique where businesses have invested their to have their businesses inside of our platform as well until revenue is generated there. We've 
just in this year, very, very proud um, that we're now beginning to engage more sponsors. We had small tier sponsors before, but now we're being able to track larger sponsors. And so that is going to be a large piece of the gener- in the revenue generated model. But because our application process is steady, we have people applying to the village market every day. Um, having the application fee helped me be able to afford hiring people on my team. So I put it, I created the village market to have a a three-tier funding model. And the last thing that we do is you and I met at Summit 21. The village market was the contracted business for the small business role. We've been able now to create an umbrella under the, the village market that now we manage other events, major events that come into Atlanta. So I'm very clear on the type of event and the type of client that if they bring us on what piece we'll be managing. And that has been a huge revenue generating model for us, being able to large, work with large companies and take that piece of it away from them. And then the village market team comes in and manage that. Interesting. So how does how does that work exactly? So they're like, we want to have a small business kind of marketplace at this event. Can you completely run that? Yes. And so my team completely runs it. So you bring in the the businesses and you ensure that everything operation wise goes down. Absolutely. Love that. And that was a beautiful experience at Summit 21. So that was just awesome. And that's where we met. So (laughs) shout out to Summit 21. Now, um, thank you. Thank you for breaking down that revenue model and, you know, being open to helping people to see and understand it. Do you also have overhead for the, the place? Is it the same place every single time? We do. We do have overhead and we base, and for people who want to get into the event world, it is always good to have your budget created of what your payout is. So X will be able to afford or, or buy this. So if the venue is $12,000, then you then for an, an organizer, then your bottom line has to be able to meet being able to pay for the venue. And I believe folks in the more in a philanthropic world, um, we sometimes hesitate with wanting to be paid. This is my issue. Used to be my issue. It's not so much now because I have very tough friends. But there also has to be money allocated to pay yourself from every event. If you don't know how to assess a vendor fee, then you set it up that way in ticket sales. For me, I don't overtask my vendors with vendor fee. Our job is to get more people through the door. So what's been the most challenging aspect of starting the village market and how have you dealt with it? Uh, All the things with being a startup. So probably, you know, some of the most disenchanting things with with being, you know, a business owner and starting something, you you lose people and you lose the people who you you kind of feel that would be there, the strength of the journey with you. That's hard. It's hard for the spirit. Uh, The business acumen it takes to be successful. Just as hard as you are building the the physical part of the business, you have to build your mind to stay aware and up to date on what it means to build a good business that that can sustain, that can get to five years and then push you to 10 years. That's hard. Um, And also in social entrepreneurship, It can be an an emotional journey when you're doing a good for a community, but you also have a standard of excellence. That standard of excellence comes with having to tell some business owners that they're not ready. It comes with businesses not meeting their deadlines and we will not issue a refund. Those are very hard phone calls to make. And we have to develop a thicker skin. I've had to develop a, a, a thicker skin and being able to stick to the standard and not waver. Um, and also the loneliness of being attentive to this thing that it ha- have called you. It doesn't matter how great your team is. If you're the person who has been called to be the visionary, there are still countless hours that you spend by yourself in solitude trying to keep building the expansion of the dream. I don't think no one prepares us for how lonely it is. 
or prepare you that when your business, your business has gone so far, how do you take it to the next level with the people that you have? Do you keep them or do you add some people on? How do you do all of it? I haven't taken a class yet that has taught that part. I've been to all the scaling classes, the forecasting. They have been they've been great. But just the business and the people acumen that it takes to sustain and sustain yourself. To me, that is has been the most difficult part of the journey. And what I've done to take care of myself, I take a, I take trips. I've learned to leave my laptop at home um, to put my email on away. I've learned that if people can't go on the journey, that means they can't go on the journey, this piece of it. They, maybe they can be in another part of my life. But if it's not benefiting the overall growth of the business, I've just learned a, a hard no with the period at the end. And some of those have come with a, a lot of tears. I'm a, I'm a filler, so I'm a lover. Um, so I never want to disappoint anyone. But I've learned, I've learned to say no, and I've learned to stick to my no. But it's extremely, extremely hard um, to get to that place. But self-care continuously saves my life. And also attracting people who are so much smarter than I am, much more successful than me. So I can always have people um, with the village market. A lot of businesses hold on to my shoulders. The reason why I can hold them up because I'm holding on to somebody else's shoulders. (laughs) (laughs) And I tell people that everywhere because we don't realize that life is such a both and in business. And what do you mean by that? The both and is that. Yeah, there are a lot of people who Dr. Key has helped. And at the same time, how I'm able to help these businesses, because there are a lot of people who've helped Dr. Key. And so I don't, I'm very appreciative when people tell me, you know, Dr. Key, Village Market changed my life. You changed my life. Um, I always say thank you. But I then tell them the other part of the people who help me be able to do the things that I'm able to do. Because I worry um, in the space that we maybe we don't talk about that part as much as we should. Um, but to, I guess to circle back and to answer your question fully, I've, I've learned to accept the things that I don't know. I'm OK with admitting I have no idea how to do this. I'm OK with asking for help. I'm OK with just because I love something. If it's not working to let it go, maybe revisit it. But my love for something is not enough. It has to meet measurable gains that are going to put that's going to push businesses forward. That's my hard baseline. Thank you. Thank you for being real about that. So you touched on a few times just how the tough decisions you have to make. I'm curious, what does your full role entail today? Oh, man, it depends on a day. Uh, you know, this journey, we're super women in capes. But day to day, I oversee the village market. I have a team who works in different departments, thankfully. But if there are customer concerns that have been elevated um, to me, then it looks like I'm on a phone, talk, phone call talking to businesses Sometimes I'm talking to community partners and meetings. I have tons of meetings every day uh, where I'm meeting with affiliates in Atlanta or hopping on a plane, going to Oakland, hopping on a plane, going to the Bahamas to be able to make sure that we are strengthening those relationships so we can have well-nested partners. Um, so day to day, lots of emails, lots of phone calls, a lot of in-person, but any elevated customer service concerns, those always go to me. And and randomly, businesses who worked with us, um, I spend time every week just randomly calling people to make sure that they're doing well after the village market, or is there anything that I can, my team and I can do? Um, And there's no formula to it. I open up our vendor sheet and whoever, you know, my, the, whatever business my spirit falls on, I just give them a call. I love that so much. Um, 
Now let's talk a little bit about the customer experience, the 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 visitors to the village market. How do you work to curate that experience? So is that another cost where you're actually each time you're doing it, you're adding in different vibes and different decor or is that something you outsource? No, it's all us. We're everything inside. We it's us at this point. Um, I'm ready to outsource. So let me put that in. in the <laughs> yes. yes, yes. <laughs> so I said we're pride, but I'm also saying it like let's cast that in the atmosphere. Right. But <laughs> every um, so the beautiful thing is we've never du- duplicated an experience at the village market, um, which means it always looks different. There's always an element of surprise. You don't know who is going to walk through the door. You don't know what type of activations we built out. That is the most favorite part. And it's also so hard because I have this crazy bar that keeps raising higher and higher. And I tell my team, so they loved it. We have to blow them away even more the next time. Uh, but the customer piece, we're always uh, seeking to seeking to improve. I want from the parking to my staff who is greeting people at the door to my volunteers who's working the floor. I want people to feel that they walked into the home of the village. And when people come into our home, they feel loved. They're not confused with where the food is. They're not confused with what time entertainment is going on. People are there, not not a board or not technology that's telling them. These are physical people that's walking people to different activations and shaking hands and hugging and kissing babies. But every experience is unique. But I'm deeply invested in people being the facilitators of these things. Now, one more thing on, you know, before we go, we've touched on revenue. We've touched on what all goes into the village market. Let's talk about profitability. Um, a lot of people, as we, you know, lose money in the first two years of their business, just keeping everything afloat. What has been your experience and how are you ensuring moving forward that the business will be profitable? Uh, um, luckily, we have never had a red year. I didn't know that that was a, a thing that that wasn't everybody's experience um, until I was talking to another person who does a rather big event in Atlanta. And he was very surprised that we haven't, we've never had a red year. We've always had. Right. A year. I think when you hear events, you just immediately, you know, you hear horror stories and you just think of how much, you know, how many things you have to pay for. So tell, tell us your, your ways. How have you managed this? <laughs> I think because I didn't have anything to compare it to. Mm-hmm. So my education background is that you get what you can pay for. Um, so I never built the village market outside outside of our means of what we can afford. So now we can afford some larger signs. But before we could do that, we didn't buy them. Because I also didn't know that people put more into an event than what the event could pay for itself. Does that make sense? Mm hmm. So I just I didn't have anything to com- compare it to. We I look at how much it costs to get this, how much it costs to get that, how much does it cost to pay all the contractors and the businesses who we invest in. And I set I centered my event and the budget around that. Anything extra I saved. I didn't I was very clear that I didn't want us the same way I managed my funds in life. I don't live or operate the village market above its means. So I knew two years ago that there was an event space that we wanted to grow into. We're in that event space now. I wanted it two years ago. Two years ago, we couldn't afford it. But my eye was being in that space. And so what I had to do was keep making each village market better. If you make it better, more people will come. If you make it the best, one of the best vendor experiences, that anyone has had, then what are they going to tell their friends who are also business owners? You need to be a part of the village market. And so because of that, we we have people who are always coming, luckily, and we have businesses who are always interested. But being able to, I also though, though I know that we're on a wave and we keep, we're ascending in this wave, I plan 
for what happens if the wave crash, then what are we going to do to pivot? And so we have things planned for 2020, 2021 of in case of whatever our pivot needs to be. But those international partnerships uh, is a part of that trajectory. Being able to potentially move the marketplace in different locations is a part of that trajectory. But I didn't, I guess I never created an event that could be in the red. That is good to know. So (laughs) now, what do you hope for the village market to become? You said you have plans for 2020 and beyond. What is your vision? My big, big vision, a big, big dream for the village market is, of course, continued growth and continued efficacy. But when people talk about the best place for Black-owned businesses, I want, without any hesitation, the village market is what people think of. Even if they live in Detroit, in the country of Mississippi, or all the way on the West Coast. That's my big vision. Um, And to ultimately grow it in this annual major event where we have smaller village markets throughout the year to continue to serve Atlanta. But the ultimate is when you see that of an essence where there is this big annual thing where hundreds of thousands of people are coming to, that's the long-term big girl goals that I have for the village market, that we will continue to be a contributor to the advancement of Black businesses financially and in the means of human capital. Um, yeah. yeah, that's that's the big girl vision. That it yes. Being at the village market, my, I tell everyone, if you have a mortgage, by the end of the night, you should be able to pay for your mortgage. Okay. <laughs> that's my goal. And then I ask people, were you able to pay for your mortgage tonight? And people make a substantial amount of money at the village market. And they can tell me yes. And it makes me so proud. Because in a human way, that's the goal. That your yes. day-to-day need can be met because of the village came to support you. So do you see any shift in terms of frequency of that? You know, it would seem like someone would say, oh, I love this so much. Can we do it more? Yeah. And I tell them that they're crazy. (laughs) People have asked us to do this month to month. And I'm absolutely not. I am barely making it, doing it three times a year. Yeah, (laughs) Barely making it. Uh, So we say no. I wish we could do it more. Um, But physically, immensely, and emotionally, we cannot pull that off. Because what we do three times a year take everything and our reserves. Yes. I can, listen, I don't know how you're doing it. Because when you say things like, you know, the Essence Fest is the goal, I'm like, they they do that once a year. Right. right, right. <laughs> so you're already doing more. But, you know, I'm really excited for the growth, especially international. And I'm just so, I can't wait to come and check it out in person myself. Um, so now we're going to jump into the lightning round. You know the deal. You just answer the very first thing that pops into your head. You ready? I'm so ready. Let's go. Let's go. All right. Number one, what is a resource that has helped you to build the village market that you can share with the Side Hustle Pro audience? A resource um, was the book that I read. It was Who Moved My Cheese? It it opens your mind. Um, read, Please read the book. Um, but also as far as people in the event space, using uh, software and platforms that automate everything has been great, like Calendly. Um, evently, these things continuously save our lives. Love it. Number two, what's been the best podcast episode or audio book other than Who Moved My Cheese <laughs> that you've consumed this year? Uh, this year, let's see. Um, it's unrelated to uh, entrepreneurship, but I, I love Sean King's podcast. I listen to that every day to stay up because in entrepreneurship, we typically don't know what's going on in the world. Yes. <laughs> so I'm always trying to find things that can streamline what's mm-hmm. going on so I can stay current. But I listen to Sean King's podcast a lot. Um, but as far as I, I also read the entrepreneur a lot as well, the entrepreneur magazine, I visit that almost every day. There's always an answer to something within their magazine. Love it. All right. Number three, what is a non-negotiable part of your day? 
my morning time is 100% dedicated to me. The village has to wait. My little cute little nephews have to wait. <laughs> <laughs> the morning time is God and key time every day. How long do you take? I'm, I know this is lightning around you guys, but I'm wondering how much, when does that cut off? What time? It cuts off when I don't need it anymore. I don't okay. put the time <laughs> in on it. So some days I need 30 minutes. Some days I need two hours. But when I feel that I'm clearly present and I can hear and I'm ready to take people in with my spirit, then I'm ready to go. All right. And number four, what is another personal habit that has helped you significantly in your business? Seeking, um, getting mentors. That has, mentors help you dream bigger. And they don't love the baby as much as you love the baby, but they love you. So they want you to do well. Um, so their advice for me have been very critical, but also always constructive. So mentorship has helped. And also taking days away from, from the business and really just pulling away and disconnecting from it. Um, because sometimes we're so close to the mirror that that's all that we can see. And we just working and spinning our wheels and then we, we burn out. So disconnecting and mentorship has saved me time and time again. And finally, number five, what is your parting advice for fellow women entrepreneurs who want to leave their, who want to be their own boss, but are worried about losing a steady paycheck? Oh, man. Um, And as I give this advice, do know that every day I have to remind myself of my own words, that if God has given you a vision and it stays with you and stays, stays with you, you cannot be afraid because what he has given you is unique and it is yours. And if you are a believer in faith, then you know that once it's been given, then the only thing you have to do is from that point is to work. It's not easy. It is lonely. But if you stay deeply invested in it, the people who are meant to help you are going to come. The days that you need rest, you can find one of your homegirls have already treated you to a massage that you didn't didn't expect. And overall, that your calling is created to take care of you because you're supposed to take care of it. So you're not out here alone, even when it feels like it. But to truly trust your inner voice and use a spirit of discernment and never do this for love, for the love of money, want the money. And nothing's wrong with that. But our actions cannot be determined and what we build cannot and should not be determined by money because it would sway our judgment. Uh, so, so powerful. Oh. So, Dr. Key, where can people connect with you after the show? Please c- connect with the Village Market first. Um, the Village Market is the Village Market ATL on all platforms. Our website as well. Uh, you want to uh, connect with me? It is Dr. Key Hallman, D R K E Y H A L L M O N, on Instagram. I've been on there more lately. I don't know what's going to happen in this. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. We thank you for sharing that, though. <laughs> <laughs> but please connect with me if, if it moves you to. Yes. Oh, thank you so much for joining us in the guest chair. I'm so glad we got to do this. <laughs> Oh, I'm so, and for you, I'm so proud of you for doing this for people like me. You are serving your calling and then some. I love your podcast. I love your spirit. And I'm just, I'm grateful to be able to sit in the chair today. Ah, Thank you. Thank you. So there you have it, you guys. Head over to sidehustlepro.co slash village market for all of the show notes, everything Dr. Key mentioned, all the links. And thank you guys for joining and listening. And I will talk to you next week. Hey, hey, thanks for listening. Now stay connected in between episodes by texting Side Hustle Pro to 44222. You'll get my weekly Six Bullet Saturday newsletters where I share what I'm up to, what I'm reading, my business tip of the week, and resources to help you grow your side hustle. And I'm working behind the scenes on some live events, which my email list will get access to first. So make sure you're in the loop. Text Side Hustle Pro to 44222 or visit sidehustlepro.co slash SBS. Thank you.